So welcome DCACM members, guests, and our esteemed speaker. We have an outstanding webinar session planned today. I'm Shahnaz Kamberi, current chair of DCACM. Before we begin, I want to take a few moments to share the DCACM goal and introduce our leadership team. Our current vice chair is Catherine McClintock, our treasurer is Anthony Clark, and our VR program chair is Sean Macbeth. With over 100,000 members, the ACM is an association for computing professionals and students. We are the DC area chapter of the Association of Computing Machinery, and our goal is to create professional development opportunities for our members. I want to take a second to announce that DCACM will be holding elections soon for the 2016-2017 cycle. Our nominees are Valerie Woolard for Chair, Victoria Batista for Vice Chair, and Anthony Clark for Treasurer. You can find out more about our nominees on our website, dcacm.org. We thank our members for joining us today, and we encourage today's visitors to become a part of our growing community. Our upcoming event is listed on your screen. I want to also announce that this is the last webinar presentation in our web series. So if you're interested in keeping these webinars going, please spread the word as we need presenters. Presenters can email scambary at dcacm.org, and we can start our next web series in the fall. We would like to thank our distinguished speaker tonight and also DeVry University for providing this Adobe Connect environment. It is now our pleasure to introduce Automated Intrusion Detection for Oil Gas Pipeline Infrastructure Protection. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Vijayan Asari. Dr. Vijayan Asari is a professor in electrical and computer engineering and Ohio Research Scholars Endowed Chair in Wide Area Surveillance at the University of Dayton. He is also the director of the Center of Excellence for Computer Vision and Wide Area Surveillance Research at UD. Dr. Asari received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology. Prior to joining University of Dayton, Dr. Asari worked as professor in electrical and computer engineering at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia for 10 years. Dr. Asari holds three patents and has published more than 500 research papers, including an edited book in wide area surveillance and 85 peer-reviewed journal papers in the areas of image processing, pattern recognition, machine learning, and high-performance embedded systems. Dr. Asari has supervised 22 PhD dissertations and 35 master's thesis, and currently several graduate students are working with him in different sponsored research projects. He has received several teaching, research, advising, and technical leadership awards. Dr. Asari is actively participating in several federal and private funded research projects, and he has so far managed around $15 million in research funding. Dr. Asari's research activities also include develop in the development of novel, novel algorithms for 3D scene creation and visualization from 2D video streams, automatic visibility improvement of images captured in various weather conditions, human identification, human action and activity recognition, and brain signal analysis for emotion recognition and brain machine interface. During the presentation, please feel free to ask questions. To ask a question of the speaker, simply type your question in the provided chat area in the lower right of your screen. If you're on Twitter, we hope you will join the conversation at hashtag DCACMWebinar at DCACM. Stay in touch with the DCACM using social media and our website. Our contact information is located on the screen. We look forward to hearing from you. Dr. Asari, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, thank, thank you. you. Sorry, sorry. Uh, can you hear uh, me? Is it okay? Yes. Hello. I can hear you. Yes. Hello. Can you see my screen? I mean, my my presentation my, my slide. Presentation slide. Not yet. Okay. So, 
Um, you should have access to sharing the screen. Do you want to try again? Something's coming up. <laughs> We can see now. Okay. Okay. So the title white, white, white awareness and security automation. Security automation. So you are able to see the screen, right? Right. Yes, we can see your uh, see your shared screen. Thank you. Thank you very much for, very much for uh, giving me the, this opportunity to present. To present. And uh, uh, actually, uh, I'm, actually I'm, uh, I'm uh, the director of. Uh, director of uh, uh, the center of center of excellence, of excellence. The basic activities, activities in the center of excellence is the, the doctor sorry your sound is coming in and out just to let you know one second please, one second, please. yes no problem Is it okay now? Okay now. Yes. Okay. So here, well, uh, in Vision Lab, what we do is we develop more uh, algorithms and architectures for real-time applications in the areas of signal processing, image processing, computer vision, pattern recognition, and artificial oh, neural networks and biomimetic object vision object recognition. That's basically the this lab. This lab. So what I want to what tell you is basically what are the research focus here and uh, what is the basic theme of this research lab what we do is this is a data exploitation research group data exploitation means from different sensors we grab the data and then we process this data to extract more meaningful information from this data so that's uh that's so you can, so you can see i'm sorry can see can you hear are you sharing a PowerPoint right now? Because we don't see a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Uh, I think something is wrong. We see your desktop, uh, but no PowerPoint. Yes, now we see the PowerPoint. Now you see the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint, the PowerPoint. Yes, yeah, so it's not full screen yet. Okay, so okay, I need to switch that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. Can you perfect. see this? Mm -hmm. Perfect. This is full okay. full screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> I was here. This is uh, the research lab activities, basically to uh, process the data collected by different sensors. That means the data acquisition block we can see. So here, uh, what we are doing is actually a, a wide area surveillance research. So most of the time, the data will be captured outside in the uh, environment. For example, uh, in a very bad weather condition, very bad lighting conditions. And sometimes data will be captured by moving 
are moving vehicles so in that case there will be a lot of uh, vibrations and shakiness in the videos and so and so forth so in the case what we do is before going to process the data what we have a pre-processing stage to remove the distortions occurred due to these environmental correct uh, issues so that's that's what we can see in the in the left top left corner the distortion correction activities uh, lighting correction activities haze and fog removal rain removal stabilization and so on and so forth these are the different uh, uh, research activities some of our uh, research group uh, members are involved in to uh, lead to their dissertations and master's thesis but they are all sponsored research projects from different agencies once we correct the data that means when we make it properly lit or properly uh, removing the haze and fog or rain and so on and so forth we go for extracting the meaningful information from that data that's by feature extraction technologies which we have use basically on spatial domain that is since it is image we talk about the spatial domain feature extraction strategies spectral domain feature extraction strategies statistical feature extraction strategies and then some phase features recently we are involved in this uh, advanced feature extraction methodologies to extract meaningful information from the data once we have the features to represent different data we classify those data by those features to to me uh, to several decisions for example uh, whether it is a facial recognition a program or a, a vehicle detection program or a human activity recognition program and so on so so forth where depending upon the different applications we define or design the cl classifiers uh, uh, based on some classical approaches or some of sometimes some neural network approaches machine learning approaches and so on and so forth so th these are all different applications applications are defined by different sponsors projects from different agencies so this is basically the flow of the uh, different research programs going on in this uh, group but this flow remains the same for all the research projects whether it is a biometric project or wide area surveillance project or an emotion recognition project or brain machine interface project this will be the basic flow of activities going on in our group we have six different research uh, groups in this uh, in this lab uh, uh, one is actually the as i mentioned image and video processing group uh, they will they are involved in enhancement super resolution that is resolution enhancement haze removal program rain removal program and stabilization program the second group is wide area surveillance group where we have object detection object recognition then object tracking 3d reconstruction from 2d images and scene change detection programs the third is a biometric group where all kind of face recognition human action and activity recognition uh, human expression analysis and uh, emotion recognition projects going on uh, then we have some uh, a vision guided robotic program we have surface navigating robots as well as the uh, small rob uh, hexacopter for grabbing data from uh, from ground and uh, we have uh, segway robots and all that so these robots actually are embedded with our vision systems and they process automatically the data and they take appropriate decisions uh, so the advantage of these robots is we can we can send these robots to remote places and uh, robots will be wirelessly communicating the data with us we have uh, another program perception beyond visible spectrum <coughs> that means we have a lidar a hyperspectral camera ir and uh, thermal cameras and uh, we have an msr detect uh, sensor and an electroencephalograph system we have a brain activity analysis group where emotion recognition brain machine interface and uh, source localization of brain waves and so on and so forth and those activities are going and going on in those group so these six groups are involved in different uh, sponsored research projects this is to give an introduction about the projects and uh, here this is uh, the project which i am specifically planning to introduce 
here this is this project is sponsored by the pipeline research council international and uh, the project is completed we have uh, uh, sent the uh, prototype for testing we tested at different places with the uh, uh, data uh, collected by fixed wing aircrafts uh, from different vendors and we processed the data at the ground as well as on on board so these uh, are giving our uh, results are much more uh, accurate than expected at the beginning so we have a very a very very successful program here which we completed recently the basically the activity is to capture the data on the pipeline right of way and process the data for uh, detecting any kind of intrusion uh, on the pipeline right of way oil and gas pipeline uh, right of ways remember we have about 2 million miles of pipelines in this country uh, i mean i'm talking about this country itself so pipelines are everywhere all over the world so this is a, a very important research project where we need to detect and protect the pipelines before uh, some kind of a leaks happening to uh, these pipelines which may cause oil leak that may lead indirectly to destroy the uh, the the uh, vegetations and sometimes the water resources and so on and so forth so uh, the basic objective of this project is actually to process the data and uh, report the, the the presence of any kind of objects that is basically we took the machinery objects that is construction equipment on the pipeline right of ways so these equipment are the initial uh, objective of our project where um, the, i mean initial objective is to detect this a construction vehicle on the right of ways so some of the examples are shown here but in, if you look at these images we can see uh, there are vehicles parked on the pipeline right of ways but uh, these vehicles uh, these images are subjected to different distortions sometimes the shadows overhanging vegetation lighting problems sometimes the equipment is too small because of the flying uh, aircraft is flying at a very high altitude Sometimes uh, the, the, the lighting, low illumination due to uh, sunlight, sometimes uh, the, the uh, cloud and so on and so forth. So these uh, distortions may occur at any time. So we need to make sure that our algorithm is uh, uh, capable of detecting all the objects, even though these kind of distortions are already existing in the imagery. Uh, the, the, these are some of the examples of the objects which we took as an initial testing or construction equipment. When we look at uh, the algorithm flow, as we can expect, the images uh, captured by these uh, flying aircrafts um, uh, will be uh, definitely subject to some kind of uh, distortions, as I mentioned in the beginning. So we have an image enhancement program as the first block at the top left you can see. And then we look at the images captured by these aircraft. It's a continuous capture of data. That means a lot of image frames will be captured and sent to the, uh, the processing station. So here, these images are uh, captured at about five frames per second. So in this case, whether we need to consider every frame for processing in order to have a real-time result, so in that case what we did is it is not necessary to process every frame specifically to detect the presence of an object we need to go for kind of a key frame selection strategy so that only important frames will be selected to uh, to uh, process to know the presence of an object so we have a key frame selection strategy before going to search for our object in the in the scene once we have a keyframe where significant information are there, in the, the we go for key region selection because the camera will be covering a large area on the ground. So in that large area, uh, the, the, the object size is only a small, occupying only a small region in the image. So whether we need to look at the entire area for searching for an object or we need to go for very important regions, significant regions within the frame. So the second processing, third processing stage here is key region selection within the selected key frame. So that region selection depending upon the importance of the regions in the scene. Once we have the key region 
depending upon the significance of that region we go for extracting the features of that region in order to find whether that's an object or not so that's that that's where we extract the features the features to represent that uh, object so once we have the features of different key regions we go for the classifiers the classifiers are trained for uh, different objects of interest which we previously decided say that uh, the construction vehicle in this example so all the construction vehicle examples given by the authorities a search for these objects so we extract those initially and train the system for finding out whether the extracted features represent one of the objects or not so once we have that uh, classific classifier output we know whether classifier is positively recognizing or an object of interest or not once we have the detected object we know the location because from the imagery which we which we are supplied contains uh, uh, the geospatial data so what based on the geospatial data the metadata provided we find out the location of that object from the pixel location of the detected object in the image frame so we map that pixel location to the geospatial location and from that geospatial location we find the distance of that geospatial location with respect to the actual geospatial location of the oil pipeline uh, from the pipeline if it is farther away from the pipeline then we consider that's not a very big threat if it is very near to the pipeline then definitely it's a threat so there is a priority assessment threat priority assessment before sending that information to the authorities so we send the location information the picture of an object and the priority of that uh, uh, threat as a as a file to and map this location to a geo i mean the uh, gis location to a, a, a google map for example and then uh, add and give that google map location to the uh, the, the uh, uh, operator so that he or she can take a decision based on uh, uh, that information whether it has, the object has to be in immediately removed or uh, they can take uh, a less pri if it is a less pri least priority uh, threat we can uh, have some more time to take a, another step so that's a, that's a, the uh, activity in this pipeline research uh, project uh here the first step as i mentioned in the previous diagram the first step is enhancement so if you look at the enhancement program we have developed an enhancement program where uh, the image is captured at a very low lighting or uh, extremely overexposed environment that is high lighting in both cases the images are distorted see for example you can see the image on the left side of the screen there the bot uh, bottom corner bottom left corner is a dark region and the middle regions are uh, reasonably lit and the top central region is actually overlit so in all these cases we need to make sure that the images are converted to a properly lit region as we can see on the right side so right side is actually a processed image from the original image which was on the left side image so this this image how can we create the right side image from the left side image the right side image which is actually what we did is we extract the information of each pixel is pixel by pixel processing the information of each pixel with respect to its neighborhood and find if it is a darker region or a well lit region or over exposed region if it is a darker region we need to increase the intensity of that region and if it is a over lit region we need to reduce the intensity of the region so the mean intensity level of that pixel with respect to its neighborhood decides what kind of amplification we need to apply to that pixel so we apply that required amplification as we can see different curves there at the center the, the uh, sharp uh, curve of uh, uh, extremely light height i mean intensity level or uh, normal level or in decrease the intensity so all these determined automatically by the Uh, the pixel intensity with respect to its neighborhood and then apply that uh, gain factor to the pixel and provide a well lit image on the right side how can we recreate the image with its appropriate coloring so what we do is before applying the intensity enhancement 
we uh, re we restore the, uh, the the color relationship that is rgb color relationship and retain that relationship even after enhancing the pixel intensities so why after why if you uh, keep that color pixel color inform a color relationship that is r to g g to b and r to b relationship the same uh, we get a beautiful image which is exactly that what 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 we see at the right side of the image uh, the screen so this is actually the flow the input color image once we have the luminance estimation then the nonlinear transformation based on the intensity of that image and then the uh, kind of high frequency boosting we do for improving the performance contrast enhancement then the color restoration keeping uh, using the initial color relationship rgb color relationship and then some uh, small adjustments auto levels adjustments and we get the color, uh, enhanced image so these are all examples of our uh, pipeline right of way images before uh, original images and the enhanced images so this uh, shows some of the exciting results here <coughs> we can see the input images enhanced images uh, in several cases here uh, you can see that uh, the water and the small grass uh, regions of uh, the top left images and the top right images of that is overexposed region the intensities are brought down to normal intensities and then we can see on the central the the, the image which i have shown as an example in the previous slide and the bottom left is again it's a, it's a beautiful uh, example for automatic driving cars auto uh, uh, the recent uh, autonomous cars and the right side right bottom is an example for our uh, biometric example because the person on that dark region is most important for us to detect and uh, recognize so we can without destroying the person on the proper lighting environments so uh, by applying our algorithm we can bring the, the the person on the darker region to light without destroying the person on the proper lighting environment so that's very important application for a, a security related uh, project so here this is an example of the video uh, uh, the left side block is the a, a video which we capture on a very low lighting environment and the right side is a, a video actually uh, processed so we can see and recognize and detect to the person so this video actually it's a it's a long video uh, so it shows uh, lots of examples and uh, uh, this is uh, the detection example so that the girl is uh, moving and uh, <coughs> the, 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 the face detection works here uh, on, the, on the enhanced image not on the uh, on the original image so <coughs> me. so here actually we take the example of a, a fog removal or haze removal where the hazy environment this haze is actually a whitening of the in input image whitening in the sense actually a white layer is being introduced into a, a clean uh, image that's what exactly the haze does so what kind of a whiteness is introduced here that's important point which we need to uh, analyze and find out so this is actually uh, the whiteness introduced on an image by haze or fog is actually determined by a concept called the dark channel prior the idea is uh, in a normal image, if we take a neighborhood of a particular pixel, for example, uh, 25 pixels of a uh, 5 by 5 neighborhood of a pixel, uh, the statistics show that at least one color component of one of the pixels, that is, if you are considering 25 pixels, there are 75 color components. RGB for each pixel, 75 color components. At least one of them will be zero. That's a, that's the statistics. If you take a larger neighborhood, it is going to be truly uh, uh, a fact. So, for example, a nine by nine neighborhood, you have 81 pixels. So you have 273 pixels, uh, 273 values. Out of this 273, 
I am sorry, 243 values. Out of these 243 values, at least one of them will be zero. It, that's a dark channel prior concept. So by introducing this haze or fog into that imagery, this smallest of the smallest value of that neighborhood will be increased by this whiteness. So that increase in magnitude, that means if you take lowest of the lowest of any pixel neighborhood in the imagery, you will see the whiteness introduced into the image that's called the, 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 the dark channel prior concept. So reducing that and applying our nonlinear enhancement algorithm, we get a haze-free image. So here actually some examples of this uh, whiteness removal. Uh, the top row shows the uh, uh, original images captured in a hazy uh, in hazy environments, and the bottom row show the uh, shows the, the the enhanced images by whiteness removal, as well as applying the nonlinear enhancement and applying our color restoration strategy. So that's another example on the left column show the original images. While the top image is actually underwater image. It works on the underwater also. Our enhancement is so so uh, powerful in applying all these ba uh, bad weather condition uh, images. So these are all some uh, a video captured by uh, our our graduate students on the uh, the uh, in our campus itself. The top left is actually the hazy video of a uh, Dayton University of Dayton campus. So the right side show the video. Uh, processed uh, by whiteness removal as well as color restoration. The bottom uh, left is the original video and the right uh, is the, uh, the the processed video. So, video. so these are all working fine in this. Uh, so, But um, I should agree that uh, the whiteness removal or the haze and fog removal is not as perfect as in the case of our um, enhancement algorithm. So I think uh, we are still continuing the work, but uh, uh, I, I can say the images or the video videos video obtained after processing are much better than the original. So the information extracted from those en enhanced videos are much more effective and uh, accurate uh, for further analysis of classifications. So uh, this is actually a second application uh, pro uh, project where we have rain removal. The rain is actually, a, a, as we know, it's a it's a dynamic noise. Dynamic noise means it's a, it's a rain streak coming from top to bottom. So it's a pretty much a stabilization, uh, registration, and uh, uh, the streak removal problem. Once we remove the streak, we need to uh, interpolate the imagery from uh, to obtain the video. So here, the video, this is processed in the video. As we can see, the rain is not completely blocking the same pixel location all the time. Because when we want to see a person on the other side of a road on a rainy day, we, if we look through the rain for some time, we'll be able to see the person because rain is not completely blocking all the time. It's a rain streak, and that means rain drops are falling down. So there are time in there are time in between the rain drops where we will we will have the visibility of the other side. So what we do is we take a set of frames in a video. See, for example, 67 frames in a video, and then take the intensity distribution of that pixel location of each pixel location we are considering in that 68 frames and then we take the the high density high intensity regions in that pixel distribution show that hey, it is affected by rain otherwise it is not affected by rain so choose those high densities and make the thresholding appropriately and then apply our our interpolation of the video frames from that means between frames we need to we are interpolating the pixels in the video frame it is so once we interpolate and recreate the video, the rain streaks will be disappearing. So that's what exactly the way we did the, 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 the uh, rain removal algorithm. So this paper was published in uh, the IJCB, International Journal of uh, Computer Vision. It's a well-recognized algorithm we developed in our group. One of our dissertations recently submitted and uh, graduated. So here we go back to the 
original project the project idea as i said uh, the the different uh, activities as uh, as we can see in the block schematics once we have the original image first step is to improve the then intensity levels appropriately by eliminating the uh, the, the low density low intensity regions and the extremely high intensity regions and make the images appropriate for processing further and then we remove the key frames by selecting the uh, uh, appropriate frames that is the significant frames for, from a set of frames and once we select the key frames go for a key region localization once we go get to the key region in the selected frame extract the features and then classify by our classifiers and uh, go for detecting and then locate the object uh, uh, based on the metadata and uh, report according to the threat priorities that's the flow of the pro uh, algorithm and uh, uh, if i talk about the key frame selection strategy uh, we can expect that uh, as in the block schematics show here the input frames we have a batch of frames select uh, considered as a batch because the first frame is considered as a key frame then go for the batch selection compute the statistical differences in the frame if there is no significant differences then go for uh, remove the pen frame as not a key frame if there are significant difference in the statistical components in the images we go for a uh, selecting a key frame so uh, uh, once we select to the key frame uh, go add to the next one more frame to go for the next batch so we remove the first frame next set of frames will be used as a batch to see i can see on the as you can see in the the block schematic on the la top right batch 1 comprises the first frame and about 100 frames for example and the second batch means first frame is removed and the second to 101st will be the second batch and so on and so forth that means for when we add one more frame we will see whether any significant difference there with respect to the mean features of the previous set and if there is a significant difference that is considered as a key frame significant difference in in terms of the statistical components of the uh, a new frame information so here once we have the key frame selected uh, we go for the key region selection in that case what we do is extract the corners by uh, in the images corners means how many corners are there corners and uh, corners represent uh, the presence of an object because if there is an object in a scene there are, there will be a lot of corners that will be comprising the presence of an object so go for a corner detection algorithm if there is a cluster of corners in one region that means there are that region is significant if there are no corners in a region means or less number of corners in the region means that image that the region is not significant so remove that because if we are searching for objects uh, uh, of our interest these are our construction vehicle for example if the construction vehicle is the, uh, uh, in the scene means that construction vehicle will comprise a lot of corners so the cluster of corners in that region that's a significant region definitely there will be other objects in the scene so there will be lots of false positive regions because key region selection it's not exactly we are going for the object selection it is key region selection to reduce the search space in the entire imagery so once we have the key region we go for uh, ex uh the, the the extracting the features so the here key region selection and uh, there's, there are there are different steps involved in this that we extract the key regions by uh, appropriately selecting the regions of interest by uh, multiple corners so we need to have a threshold of number of corners to be detected as a as a cluster of importance or not so that's a, that's a, uh, is, i mean uh, empirically determined values we use for uh, by experimenting several imagery for our own uh, objects of interest and then go for uh, deciding the, uh, the the threshold and find out uh, which are the regions which are more important or not once we have the key region selection um, the, the go for extract the features in the feature extraction strategy what we do is we are searching for objects 
So there are several points which we need to consider. For example, in one case, we need to know whether there will be overhanging vegetation. If there are overhanging vegetation, we need to make sure that the objects are covered, uh, partially covered, then the objects are visible, but though, but not completely visible. So this portion or parts of the objects are available and the parts of some parts are not available. So it is it should be a part based approach. For example, in a human detection algorithm, if by face detection, so face detection, if somebody is a face recognition project, for example, if we go for recognizing a person of interest in front of us, he is appearing in front of us with a sunglass because eye features are extremely important for recognizing a person. So if we want to recognize a person by eye features, if he, is, he or she is wearing a sunglass, there is no point extracting the eye features or considering the eye features to recognize that individual. Instead, what we do is eliminate that eye region and go uh, and process uh, other regions like uh, nose, mouth, uh, and maybe forehead and the cheek and chin and so on and so forth. There are significant features there, but the most important features are missing. So what we do is we give more weightage for the available features and uh, still we recognize that person. So that's a, the, the, so similarly, somebody is wearing a mouth. Uh, maybe mask, we don't go for extracting the mouth features. We go for weighing the other available features a little bit more than what it was uh, earlier uh, and we uh, detect or uh, recognize that individual. So similar way we applied for this uh, de uh, detection of the objects. If there is, uh, the, the objects are actually comprising by, comprised by different uh, regions. So a region-based approach means a part-based approach. So if we divide the entire imagery representing that object of interest into different uh, local regions, and then this local region features will be extracted and uh, concatenate all the features of the local regions to make a long vector to represent that object, object uh, as a long uh, feature vector and then give weightage to the different regions appropriately based on the significance of, of that region. So if it is covered, if it is low intensity, if there is a shadow, give less importance to that region. If it is an overhanging vegetation, less importance to the region and uh, mo give more weightage for the available other features. So likewise, a part-based approach has to be applied for uh, classification. So once we have the part-based approach, we will be able to uh, handle the partial occlusions in the imagery to detect or recognize the object. But in this case, we are looking from the aerial view from top and in the equipment can appear in any viewing angle in any direction. So what we need to do is we should have a rotation invariant approach for recognizing an object. So if our original image for training our system was appearing in one direction and in the testing image, the object may be appearing in other different directions, the object features may be different. So in that case, what we need to do is we have to have the feature set which should be rotation invariant. So the rotation invariance is incorporated by applying kind of a ringlet approach. That means we divide the image into different parts, but the part-based approach was originally designed or defined by dividing the image into different blocks. Here, that block division is done by non-overlapping rings. So if we compute the intensity distribution of each ring, whatever be the direction in which that object lies, doesn't matter, the ring intensity distribution remains the same. So that's the reason why we went for a ringlet approach, that is over, non-overlapping rings as parts of the object, and then go for extracting the features of the rings, and then concatenate the rings to have the entire feature set of the object, and then go for our classification. The, the, the features which we go for is a Fourier histogram of oriented gradients, as we can see on the bottom center of the 
uh, slide. So here, uh, the, the the object of uh, the, the entire block diagram is written here, uh, drawn here. Raw image, image enhancement, background elimination, and then part based model for object recognition. That part based model is actually a ringlet approach. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, the partitioning strategies which we did. Uh, the originally as uh, so the different blocks in the image, but later we went for the ringlet approach as I explained in the previous slide. So the once we have the the, the features of each object, uh, uh, that means features of the object uh, described by the previous methodologies, we need to classify the object uh, objects. So if we have, for example, 15 objects in our list, that is here in this case, n number of objects in our list uh, to be searched on the pipeline right away, we apply a kind of a cascade of classifier approach cascade of classifiers means first the cl first classifier is designed for object one and with respect to every other object second classifier is ob object two with respect to every other object and third classifier is object three with respect to every other object that means likewise the first object de uh, classifier decides whether it's object one or anything else that anything else goes to the second classifier and then that decides whether it is second object is there or not. Then go for the third classifier, whether the third object is there or not in the remaining sets. So likewise, it continues and find out whether the any one of the object is available there or not. So that's what exactly the cascade of classifier approach. And the, if any one of the classifiers actually detect the the presence of an object then we have the decision as an object otherwise it's a non-object region so if the key region and then the, the the features in the key region we are going to say whether it represents an object or not by any one of the classifiers if none of the classifiers is giving a positive answer then that key region selected is not an object this is an example of a of an imagery where a construction vehicle we can see there and uh, by doing the uh, part based detection we can detect the object uh, and its priority uh, the most significant parts is actually marked red and less significant part is marked green it's a backhoe and then we have another example slightly overhanging vegetation but we can see the object there and uh, the, the the automatic algorithm uh, detects the uh, region and we can see in this image actually there are two key regions uh, extracted one is actually a wrong uh, a false positive false key region the other one is actually an object so the key regions uh, informations are uh, extracted and the classifier decided it's a tractor so that's all, all the main steps in this algorithm where uh, uh, we can detect and uh, 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 classify the objects to one of the objects of our interest. Then we go for the threat priority assessment that is uh, uh, less uh, uh, processing uh, stage, less hard to do that. So the, actually what we need to do is um, we need to find out the pixel location, map the pixel location to the geolocation from the metadata and then find out the distance of that object with respect to the pipeline center line and then uh, assess the threat priority to high, medium or low before reporting to the authorities or operator. So this is the uh, algorithm outcome which we, we designed. So we have the input imagery. We have a graphical user interface for the operator to that is the flight operator to use, where he can select the um, shape file and so on. so many so many uh, facilities are available in this uh, GUI. And uh, the operator what he wants to do is just start processing. Once he start processing, the processing pipeline takes care of the enhancement or uh, key region selection and uh, keys key frame selection key region selection feature extraction classification and then the threat priority assessment all this information will be mapped to a, a excel file as we can see at the bottom of the free is uh, the, the screen 
uh, where we have the frame number, a uh, frame name, la uh, latitude, longitude, distance to pipeline, then the uh, AGL, uh, horizontal pixel size, that is the the, the GST graphical, I mean the ground sample distance uh, calculated and threat priority assessment, whether it is uh, uh, priority one or priority two or three, depending upon the high, medium, low, and then uh, the confidence of the imagery. That is actually whether that image is good enough to uh, take an appropriate decision or not. The, the, the data confidence, that is what exactly the last column says. So this Excel file is the one we are uh, sending to the user along with the detected threat images. Once we have the threat image on this information, we'll be mapped to the KML file that is mapping to the KML file to the Google Earth uh, or Google Maps. Once, uh, so the, 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 the officer uh, will be getting that location on the Google Earth so they, he or she can take the decision based on the threat priority and the location information and the image information. So these are all the experimental results which we uh, uh, tried. Uh, the two different data sets uh, uh, are indicated here. But the first one has a, about 4,380 frames we processed. The uh, true positive rates are 93.6, uh, false positive rates are 22.9 and uh, false negative rate 6.4 percentage. In the data 2, uh, it is uh, better performance. Uh, 10,983 frames we processed, 95.4 percentage GPR and 17.7 uh, percentage FPR and 4.6 percentage false negative rate. So what we are currently involved in is actually processing the uh, data uh, using a GUI, uh, pros providing a GUI where uh, we need to uh, provide some additional information to the or additional facility to the algorithm means. See, for example, if we are uh, training this system with the data captured in Philadelphia and testing the system in Phoenix, there will be a lot of false positives and false negatives. So we don't want to take any kind of risk because the background environment in this imagery are extremely different. So this system is actually looking at an object with respect to its background. See, this is exactly the same as providing the information uh, or provide, uh, asking a pilot to fly and find out an object in Philadelphia and suddenly he is deployed in Phoenix, he takes, it takes a few seconds for him to understand the environment. Once he understood that it is, I am not flying in Philadelphia, I am flying in Phoenix, then he will uh, definitely take care of detecting the object. So uh, this is what exactly the philosophy we used for uh, training the system, not only with the objects of interest, we need to train the system uh, along with some kind of a background information. So once we have a system trained with the 15 objects, for example, objects of interest, and trained with the Philadelphia background, and if we are taking this system to Phoenix, we need to make sure that the Phoenix background environment, not the objects of interest, we have the 15 objects of interest already trained in. So the, the background of the Phoenix environment should also be introduced into the system. The system should be able to train the background so that it can reject the background taking only the objects in. So that background learning philosophy is what exactly we are introducing into the system. So if we take, if the operator takes the system to Phoenix, he has to use some of the previously captured data from Phoenix to feed into the system and ask the system to get it trained, that the system will train the background also along with whatever we had earlier 15 objects of interest. So the system will be trained and then go and deploy the system on the aircraft so that system will automatically detect all the objects in that newly trained background. So that's important uh, aspect which we found 
that was missing in our first prototype so we are developing that background training strategy so now we we already experimented and found the system uh, is successful in this because we by doing experiments at the different environments um gary indiana philadelphia west virginia and virginia we found that this is another important point which we need to uh, introduce into the system so we are working on that we already tested and the the, the, the gui will take care of uh, helping the operators to do this self training uh, activity uh, in our the, the new uh, uh, project which we are uh, planning is actually incorporating two different imagery visible imagery and hyperspectral imagery processing the hyperspectral and it, uh, the visible imagery, imagery separately and extract the information and fuse the information to represent the features appropriately so that we will not miss any one of the objects because um, we can we can even process the data in different uh, extremely different weather conditions like uh, sometimes uh, the extremely different weather conditions the the, the visible imagery may fail so that's a, a reason why we need to incorporate the hyperspectral imagery to make the system more elegant that's a fusion of hyperspectral and visible imagery for making a more novel system <coughs> so this are uh, some of the example uh, frames uh, which uh, automatically detecting the objects uh, from the scene so we have the uh, scene here we can see the object of interest lying there and then we detect the object is there in this scene um, slightly occluded but it's a different uh, camera captured this data these are all uh, you can see the images are of different color combinations because these are all captured by different cameras so um this is another object another example here uh this is going for the sensor too see the see the, the the data is totally different because the sensor is giving this data uh green is represented as some the more yellowish uh, but uh, the processing algorithm takes care of whatever be the the sensor characteristics the processing is effective in that sensor data too so here this is sensor 3 which is more green and uh, the, the, the it is flying low, low, more uh, uh, high altitude so it is still capturing data so this is another example the object is being captured here and these are all the different examples so this is going on uh well and uh, different uh, i'm i'm moving a little fast uh, going fast forwarding this images and uh, uh these are all examples where <coughs> the threat detection algorithms are there so we now we are switching to another group of activities going on in our group uh, in this vision lab on biometrics so uh that's totally different from our original project uh, idea that is the pipeline research council international project so the any questions or any can i continue hello uh that is sorry i think we can go 10 more minutes since we did start a little bit late um so go ahead okay okay so um uh, this is actually the uh, date of uh, the processing and biometric data analysis for human identification the most important aspect here is actually detecting a face region from a uh, group of uh, people images <coughs> so once we detect the uh, face region in an image on the top left we can see a lot of people standing there with a different profile information that is profile means in the sense of uh, 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 frontal face uh, side uh, profile face different poses different size different uh, colors and so on and so forth so whatever be the, the the appearance of that face we should be able to uh, uh, detect and recognize the uh, uh, person so here 
uh, I am going. I am. Can you see the video here? So this this okay. yeah. video shows that the person is yeah person is moved at the different viewing angle, so we can recognize detect the person irrespective of the uh, appearance of that person. You know, so uh, he is coming closer to the camera, moving away from the camera, different viewing angle, and so on and so forth. That's a basically the the, the face detection algorithm. Once we detect the face, we extract the features of the face. Uh, as I said at the beginning, you know, the, the, the algorithm processing flow remains the same. Here the application is face. So extract the features of the face and then classify based on our, our, uh, our previously stored information. That is a list of people to be searched in the, uh, in the database. So uh, that is about the face recognition. Once we recognize the faces, uh, we can uh, go further for expression analysis, emotion recognition. We have an action and activity recognition. And then we have an iris recognition, iris-based human identification project going on in this group. So here, um, So the, the uh, recognition algorithm, as I said, uh, uh, the face detection, face feature extraction, and feature classification, as in our previous project here, also the same processing flow. Once we have that uh, algorithm, and, uh, we need to test in a wide area surveillance environment. This is actually the images captured in a public environment, in an airport environment, for example. The people appear in totally different uh, viewing angle, different resolutions, uh, different expressions, different behaviors. So in these cases, the, 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 the algorithm so far, any face recognition algorithm may fail. So how can we apply, uh, develop a very novel algorithm which will be able to take care of all these varying appearance environment? That's, uh, that's where we started our contribution to uh, minimize the processing to different uh, conditions like uh, enhancement as I said we need to make sure that those people are hiding in a shadow should also be brought to light and then go for skin region segmentation that is the the the, the, uh, the same procedure as our pipeline research council international that is actually here it's a key region segmentation here the the key regions are skin regions in the in the image human skin so face or uh, 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 is a human skin. So irrespective of the face, I mean the skin color or texture, we have a skin uh, segmentation algorithm which will be able to focus the skin region in the entire imagery and segment out the seg skin regions and then extract the features of that skin region and classify that features to a human face or not. Once it is detected as a human face, go for feature tracking you, you because the people may move and extract the features of that human uh, face uh, to classify whether it is person one person two person three and so on and so forth so here it's an example of our skin region segmentation algorithm we found that the skin region actually uh, in a particular a transformed color space it compra it, it focuses to a, a a pipe line in a pipeline in a transformed multi-dimensional color space. If we segment that pipe region, we end up with only the skins of the different human beings. So skin region actually, it is a skin color distribution is slightly wider because it is not a lighter, extremely lighter skins to the extremely darker skins. So if we can see on the bottom of uh, images, actually uh, on the left, the original image, with the different skin uh, people there, skin colors, and uh, on the right side image, we have the skin region segmented. There, but there are some false positive regions, but that doesn't matter. We have the next algorithm coming up, which will be doing the face detection from the re segmented skin regions to face or not face. So the human face or not a human face of the from the skin regions. See, for example, there are skin light regions like a a wood or whatever it means so somebody's dresses and so on and so forth. The small regions can be eliminated by this face detection algorithm. So we classify the face, the the, the detected uh, extracted skin regions to face or not face. Once we have the face detected, I mean this is a, a additional examples of 
face rec- uh, detection it's not recognition it's a face detection detecting whether it's a human face or not once we see this or another example where the top left is a person appearing in a very dark environment in a overexposed region involved in this image and we need to make sure that the person is uh, detected and then the second image on the right top also it's two faces the the, the brightness on the back side the persons are not visible so we need to enhance it appropriately and the bri- overexposed region should be reduced in the, their intensity and then the faces are detected and here different viewing angle different poses different uh, orientations and uh, these are all the examples which i shown earlier and then go for the extraction of features of the faces extracting the features as i said earlier if somebody is wearing a sunglass we need to make sure that uh, he is or she is um, uh, taken care of that means we need to mo- go for part based approach or region based approach so different poses different viewing angle occlusions and so on and so forth so the region based approach will take care of the 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 recognition of the individuals even though there are occlusions and uh, this uh, post invariant approach will take care of the whether the person is appearing in different viewing angle or pose and expression invariance and all these cases we need to make sure that the person is appropriately classified but uh, the example which i want to quote is actually in a in a typical case where we need to uh, need to find a person in an airport for example and that person's image a lot of images are not available for us to train this system in that case we may have only one image of a person uh, of the wanted person uh, from maybe from the driver's license or from a visa uh, uh, issued or from a passport or whatever we have one or two images of a person in that case this one or two images may not be sufficient enough to train the system if even when the persons appear in different viewing angles so in that case we need to make sure that we generate a series of images of that person from that one or two images available and then uh, use that series of images at different viewing angle different lighting different uh, uh, expressions to train our system to make sure that he or she will be uh, recognized in a environment where that person appears in any viewing angle with any expression and so on and so forth that's the idea where we developed a synthetic database creation using single training image what we do is we create a 3d uh, model of a mean 3d face from so many 3d images scanned by the 3d 3d scanners and this 3d mean image will be morphed with our original one frontal face or one image and then that morphed continuously continuously and create the 2d image of that morphed image and compare with the original image and if there is a difference morph it again again get the 2d image and find out the difference and keep tra- iterating iterating that 3d model that is a morphing philosophy for, for morphing activity should be continued until we get the 2d of that 3d recreated 3d is exactly same as the original image that means we are going to create a 3d of that person with a single input image and that 3d image of that person will be used for creating a sequence of 2d images of the same person as we can see on the right side of the screen so well, that sequence of 3 2d images created from the person the yes yes uh, dr sorry um i think we should <clears throat> take some questions now and then try to wrap up oh. Uh, just okay. because of time sorry okay. thank you so much okay please go ahead yeah uh, uh how i mean can we stop it or we can we can go and uh, for 2 minutes 
Uh, I guess you can uh, keep talking as the as uh, uh, participants are typing their questions in. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is one of the examples we we have seen in our uh, um, our lab students. Actually, they are um, detecting, recognizing, tracking uh, uh, people in a uh, group environment. And then we 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 are successful in this process. We can see people at uh, different ethnicities and uh, different skin colors, and um, uh, are recognized appropriately, even though they are moving and occluded by others. So that's the um, face recognition algorithm we have. So this is another example. This is a very important example, actually. That's what exactly we want for uh, our. Um, Sorry, this video is not playing. I'm sorry. So the left side is actually the original image and the original video. The right side is actually the recognized person. It's a video. It's not playing. I can show it separately. So we have a question from Nick or comment, I guess. <laughs> ah. ah. <laughs> Oh, uh, what's the question? Oh, what's the question, please? Uh, it says, so you have a 3D generalized head model, and by fitting one arbitrary angled image, you can predict a 2D projection from another angle. Or is that a question or comment? I'm not sure. Yes, actually, from the arbitrary model, we are creating a... <laughs> Go ahead. This is what, right? Uh, I can see the question here on the on the screen. So it's right. Oh, okay. So uh, what do you what do you what do you, what you are asking is the a, a generalized 3D model is shown there. That 3D generalized model is a mean 3D model which is morphed by the uh, one single image and create a 3D model of that person by iterative procedure. This is an offline process. And then we create 2D images of that person with from the 3D recreated 3D. That's, a, that's the idea. I mean, is that the question or I mean? Nick says that makes sense. <laughs> uh, anyone else have any more questions? Yeah. All right. I don't see anyone typing, Dr. Asari, so I don't think there are any more questions. Would you like to share like a contact information with everyone? Um, so maybe they can uh, contact you outside of this webinar My video if they have any more questions right or comments. So this video is so working now. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have, uh, I mean, some uh, other activities are going on here. So we have the contact information. Actually, I can show the, uh, this is all wide area surveillance applications, tracking objects and all that. I'm just going um, further to, um, uh, for processing. Uh, after enhancement, we can see, so, better information and uh, here this is another important information where we are tracking a small per, I mean object act it's a, a person on the ground from 7,000 feet altitude imagery captured by aircrafts so, so different cars and trucks and labeling them and uh, after enhancement processing everything and we have the building change detection in satellite imagery and uh, we have another project which is actually 3D reconstruction from 2D video. And then we have uh, another project on LIDAR data analysis for converting the, I mean, uh, uh, classifying to vegetation, building, vehicles, fences, ground, and power lines. And these are all, uh, another project is actually brain signal analysis for emotion recognition and brain machine interface. As we can see, that person is wearing a headset and controlling the robot. That's a wirelessly communicated brain data processed by the day, uh, the process. He is thinking of uh, making that robot do some job. So, uh, so that's another project which we have. So that's all. I mean, 
uh, the different activities in this group. The uh, information of the website of the lab, all these projects are listed and uh, brief descriptions are provided in our website. It is visionlab.uraten.edu. Uh, my contact is vasari1 at uraten.edu. So, I mean, uh, there is a question, vegetation? V, V in Victor, V, uh, sorry, one, V in Victor. V, uh, sorry, one, dot, uraten, dot, edu, that's right. So, any any other questions, please? Uh, we have uh, one that uh, says, "Oh, can you read it?" Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is that? What's the question? I mean, it's it's missing, you know. Okay. So, it says, can you elaborate more on the learning process for threat detection? Oh, okay. Learning process for threat detection. I can I can go back to that. Uh, uh, so, we have a set of objects to be detected in our, in our uh, list of objects there, you know. So, in that list of objects, what we need to do is extract the features of those objects. That is actually the objects uh, features are ringlet features of that object. So, each ring is uh, ring region, uh, we compute the uh, what's called the Fourier histogram of oriented gradients, and we have multiple ring regions. All the ring regions will be concatenated, and make ring ring region features will be concatenated, make a long vector with appropriate weightage. That is called the ringlet approach for representing objects for appropriate classification. So, this classification means we train the classifier that is an SVM classifier, support vector machine classifier for object 1 with respect to everything else. The second SVM will be classified, classifying uh, or trained for object 2 with respect to everything else. And third classifier will be uh, trained for object 3 with respect to everything else. So, each classifier will be verifying the features, incoming features and then cla I mean, um, classifying appropriately. The training process means we are using a support vector machine for uh, training the system. Is that uh, what you mean or? Uh, Yes, that's what the uh, participant said. <laughs> that's good. Okay. okay. Any other questions? All right, Dr. Asari, thank you so much for your time and your great uh, presentation. Oh, I think we have somebody typing. Oh, okay. So, yes, thank you so much for your time and your presentation. Uh, thank you for everyone who participated today. Um, I will have this YouTube video up soon uh, by the end of this week. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.